Good afternoon. How are you? My name is Lucia Gomez, and I am going to be joined very shortly by Raquel Batista, um, who is currently the new commissioner for immigrant affairs. I am the political director for the New York City Central Labor Council, and I'm going to kick us off with a little bit of a conversation around what we just saw in the last June 22nd primary, the major primary in the city of New York, uh, to elect the mayor, uh, controller, obviously public advocate with the existing public advocate, uh, Jumani Williams, um, currently in the position and still not term limited, but so many other positions were term limited, including all the borough president races um, that took place this last June 22nd primary. We're still waiting the official results, obvious, uh, results. Um, for those of you who are not aware, we actually uh, conducted for the first time well, in a long time, uh, for the first time in New York City, uh, citywide elections, as well as in city council and municipal races, uh, we conducted these elections using ranked choice voting, a system which allows uh, voters to select up to five candidates of their choice um, instead of the traditional system of electing one individual. Um, and therefore, the winner take all system and, in for, count, and for citywide races, um, if they did not meet the threshold um, of 50 plus one, then they would go into a runoff uh, and win in those uh, elections. Uh, we would have a second round of elections. Now, that was eliminated. And as we can now know, today is July 6th, and we're still waiting uh, on the results of um, the final results of ranked choice voting. Uh, we saw an initial round of preliminary numbers that were provided without the use of the absentee uh, ballots or the affidavit ballots for that matter. And so everyone's uh, waiting today. We were supposed to get some preliminary numbers. Uh, but let's just do a quick recap. Right. Um, during the June 22nd evening votes, the same day the ballots cast that day, as well as the early voting ballots for those that took uh, part in the early vote period of June 12th um, through June 20th, uh, we actually saw the results of the mayoral races um, dictate that Eric Adams was the winner of, the, of that particular uh, round of counting. Um, Maya Wiley took in second place and Catherine Garcia uh, took in third place. Now, uh, with over 30 percent, Eric Adams, you know, uh, took the lead. Uh, but in order for in this system for you to win outright, you need a 50 plus one um, win margin in order for you to actually be uh, considered the official winner. As a result, uh, a week, you know, a couple of days, I would say uh, we probably got it. Uh, last Friday, so about a week later, uh, we saw some preliminary rounds of numbers um, where we actually uh, were able to see how individuals voted for their second choice, their third choice, their fourth choice, and so forth. And so uh, we were able to see the first rounds um, elimination uh, of second choice votes uh, by there was, I believe, almost 13 candidates, and so that was eliminated. Um, in the end, uh, what we saw after so many rounds is that we saw Eric Adams still leading, um, but very close behind is Catherine Garcia. So as you can tell, the, the win went from um, Adams, Wiley, Garcia to an Adams, Garcia, then Wiley on a close third. And so um, it's exciting times because this is the first time um, that such a process is put forth in such a huge election uh, with so many voters. I think total round that we're going to see a votes cast after um, getting the absentee ballots around 940 some odd thousand uh, ballots that in fact uh, would be cast in 2013, which was the other largest uh, mayoral race that we saw uh, when Mayor de Blasio was elected. Um, there was about, I want to say 713,000 some odd votes uh, cast in 2013. Um, so we did see a, a large surge in um, not necessarily voter turnout. There was some surge of voter turnout, but definitely there was uh, a large number of new registered uh, Democrats um, in the city of New York during that last period. And so for the Democratic primary, we're still waiting the final. It's definitely going to come down to absentee ballots um, and affidavit ballots even in, in order for us to get a good margin. But we are seeing that Eric Adams is still leading the pack. 
Uh, for controller, we saw uh, definitely an interesting dynamic take place where uh, council member Brad Lander is still in first place, both and with us, you know, with the with the margin of about I want to say like twenty thousand votes over uh, the final round of ranked choice voting um, over Speaker Corey Johnson. And so, whereas Corey Johnson had been seen as the front runner. Uh, with a much larger margin in the last couple of weeks, um, definitely Brand Lander uh, would be the upset victory if, in fact, he's able to hold over um, with the absentee ballots once they get counted. So today is the day that the Board of Elections has said uh, that they will be releasing those numbers. We have seen what a difficult moment the Board of Elections has had. I mean, it continues to have uh, so many comments that I've read online in different social media, um, uh, social media outlets that, in fact, um, and news outlets throughout uh, the last couple of days where uh, we're seeing what the major problems are with the New York City Board of Elections and probably the entire Board of Elections in the, in, in the state. Um, so many different municipalities and towns and issues that are had when Board of Elections are in fact political appointments. Um, and so a lot of pressure is on Albany right now to make the necessary changes uh, that are needed in order for ha us to have a clearer result than two weeks um, two weeks in after the primary. Um, obviously, we knew this was going to happen. Everyone knew, and it wasn't just an issue of the Board of Elections, but it was. it's the first time with such magnitude um, that we were going to see ranked choice voting being implemented um, and with absentee ballots, uh, you know, still not having been counted. It's an interesting dynamic. We haven't had a summer, a June primary in the city of New York um, ever. And so this is the first time that, you know, this time period, as well as um, the, in the, the use of ranked choice voting and the early voting, um, that obviously the Board of Elections is not up to the task of being able to produce numbers um, that are reliable and that the um, electorate can actually feel, New Yorkers can actually feel that they can rely on. So um, we saw a, a large number of newly elected uh, city council members. Um, and I am, you know, I am curious to have a conversation with Raquel as soon as she gets on about what she sees as the prospects of this new council. There's a lot of commentary about uh, the kind of council that has been elected, the kind of politics that they will push forward, um, you know, an understanding of the kind of politics uh, that we saw in the last couple of years in both the de Blasio administration as well as the city council under different uh, speaker speakers of uh, Speaker Melissa Mark Riverito and now uh, Speaker Corey Johnson. Uh, you know, the reality is that we're really curious as to what this new council will bring. This is a council that, in fact, is being touted as being the most progressive, if we can use that term, or more like more uh, left and definitely, um, you know, folks using words as communists or socialists. And so I'm curious to see uh, what that all really means and how that's going to play out. Hello, Raquel. I'm, I'm actually having a conversation with myself and with the audience <laughs> about uh, the council races and the politics and the dynamics uh, that we're going to see about what progressive means, what all the criticism or the conversations around us having a, a lefty count city council really means and, and uh, you know, the terminologies that we're hearing being thrown all over the place with you know, socialism and communism. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm always like, well, what does it yield uh, to our communities and what does that really mean? And so, you know, everyone can throw all their analysis, you know, analysis. They're going to say as many things. I don't recall anyone being as left as Melissa Margarito. Um, you know, the speaker at that time really kind of pushed forward interesting um, agenda items that, that were put up for votes. Um, but definitely, I think this is going to be a council um, that I'm excited to see. And so we're going to stop right there on the electoral combo uh, because, you know, I did run down and I was about to run down all the borough presidents and all the exciting things that I'm seeing. But we don't have any final numbers and I'm sure we're going to have a deeper conversation in another show. Pero take it over if I can. Well, Lucia, thank you so much for getting us started today. And I just wanted 
to first say, you know, thank you to all of our viewers. Thank you to the Manhattan Neighborhood Network uh, for all of the work that's been happening with Critica NYC. We took a little bit of a break because as some of you may know, um, I have just recently been appointed to be the Commissioner of Immigrant Affairs for the Mayor's Office in New York City. So I am now back in New York, which I am so excited about. This is my fourth week of work. And um, I've just been, you know, getting the downloads, meeting with leaders, talking about the issues that are impacting immigrants in New York City. And so, you know, because of this new job that I have, um, I won't be hosting um, the show. However, now we have Lucia Gomez, which all of you just met earlier, uh, who also in her full-time work is a pol political director at the New York City Central Labor Council. And um, she will be helping, you know, us continue the show. I'll be doing some things behind the scenes, but won't necessarily be in front of the camera as I have been for the past year and a half. And, you know, both of us, you know, because this, this program was founded really with the inspiration of our mentor, Angelo Falcón, um, you know, we thought that, right, Lucia is the right person because she was his like number one person that he downloaded like all the information to. And uh, I'm just really excited to, to have her be a part of the show and to continue the conversation that we've been having about Latinos um, in New York City and throughout the country and the issues that impact us. And, you know, all the work that all of these fantastic leaders have been doing and um, I'm just really uh, in, excited, enthusiastic, and you know, and I know that the conversations will continue to be thought provoking and really looking at, you know, not only, you know, our stories, but the data, the numbers, um, looking at all the issues that are gonna be, cause things never stop, right? And so we know that we have the transition that's going to be happening at the end of this year at the local level in New York City. We're going to be having redistricting. And so what is that going to mean for New York City and for the rest of the country and for states like Texas? I mean, there's just, the, it goes on and on. So um, I'm really excited on, you know, all the things that we're going to be talking about. So we are talking about a little bit of everything today. And, um, you know, Lucia is in La República Dominicana having a great and wonderful time. And I'm in the terrenas. The rest, because she has worked really hard on these last elections. So, um, you know, I'll just pass it to you, Lucia, and we can, you know, keep talking. Well, I think, like you said, I, I did decide that it was time for me to take a little bit of a break, right? Um, it's been very much a challenging uh, last year and a half, absolutely, um, and more so in the last couple of months where, you know, depending on what side of what campaign or how many endorsements or, you know, just staying and, and being uh, with the pulse of New York City residents and our workers and fighting the fight of making sure folks stay safe and get vaccinated. It's been a very interesting and trying time. And so I did take some time uh, to come out and enjoy the sun and the beach and spend some time with the family. And, you know, one thing I would say though, Raquel, is that, you know, it's very interesting that you have joined um, the New York City um, municipal race. I mean, the New York City um, administration in these times, right? In the middle of everything that was happening and when we're about, when we just opened up. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about what your vision is for, I mean, this is the mayor's office of immigrant affairs. You know, the first time we had, um, that position, right? Was it Guillermo Linares who was the first um, commissioner, was it? Or? Sayu uh, Bajwani, who was ah. the first um, immigrant affairs commissioner. And then after her, it was Guillermo Linares, who was the first and only Latino who has had that position in the past. 
and first and only Dominican, right? Because he Dominican, and so uh, now our next comisionada, um, Raquel Batista. So curious as to what the, I mean, this is tough, right? Six months left in, an, in a mayor's administration. It is the mayor's office, right? Of American Affairs will have a new mayor in January, but I know you never wait. Right. So what are some things that you might, you know, you just already hit the ground running that we should be expecting, um, especially when our immigrant communities have been the hardest hit, some of the hardest hit neighborhoods um, throughout all of New York City? Yes. So the there's two big priorities for the mayor right now. One, of course, is the vaccination campaign. And I uh, have received uh, both of my shots. I got my second shot. Um, two weeks ago, and I, I'm going to say, I'm going to be honest, it was a little rough, um, but, you know, I survived it. And, you know, I would say also, you know, I was one of those folks who was hesitant. Um, you know, I wasn't sure whether or not I should, you know, move forward, but, you know, I had family members that got the vaccine. And they did fine. And I was getting this job offer. And in order for me to work and to be in contact with the public, I felt like, you know, really the best and safest thing was for myself to get the vaccine. You know, and while, you know, I do uh, respect, you know, people making their own personal choices for a variety of reasons. Right. If you are a person that, you know, isn't susceptible to, you know, very bad reactions, you know, people should be getting, going out there and getting their vaccines, especially in a city like New York City, where we have over 8 million people living in the city. Everyone is tight on the trains. Um, and as the city starts opening up and more and more people are getting together and gathering and working, you know, it's critical that people... <laughs> vaccine. The second big um, a push that the mayor wants to make is to encourage New Yorkers who are eligible to become citizens. So we are going to be working um, over the summer to make a big push to encourage people to um, apply for their citizenship. You know, one of our big concerns is because of the pandemic and because of the lockdowns, um, a lot of services weren't necessarily available to people, right? And people were not prioritizing getting their immigration papers done because, you know, frankly, and as we know, uh, most New Yorkers were really concerned more with surviving, right? Getting food for their families, if they were able to pay rent, pay rent, trying to figure out those issues. Um, you know, we have the excluded workers who weren't eligible for any of uh, for a lot of the benefits that that came from the federal government, and hopefully we'll be getting access to funds um, starting in August of this year from New York State. So you know, there's just so many reasons as to why people have not been, you know, accessing things that they are already eligible for. We had the whole issue with the public charge, right? Where before. Um, I mean, Raquel, let's not ignore. We had the whole issue with number 45. Yes, yes. So we had. <laughs> that's the big cuckoo in the room. Like, that's the. <laughs> it was a big cuckoo. Pero el cuckoo se fue, but there's still, you know, some ghosts left, right, that we're working through. And so now that the public, the public charge rule has been reinstated, that means that people who would in the past would have been eligible for waivers can now apply and get those waivers for their application. So, you know, there's a lot of education that needs to happen around that and really, really encouraging people to come out and, and do their applications. Those are two, but there's so many issues. I mean, really, like every day there's something new, you know, coming across my desk, whether it's, you know, what's going to happen with the eviction moratorium, getting people access to rental assistance, right? Um, trying to figure out, you know, issues that are occurring, you know, in, in other parts of the city. So there, there's really, there's, there's a lot to do. Um, and I'm really excited because, you know, while, you know, I think that 
I, I've been able to kind of over this last year, right? We were all quarantining. And so I'm energetic. I'm ready. I've been sitting at home for a year and a half. So I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to be there for New our New Yorkers, for our immigrant New Yorkers. And, you know, and that's really what we need. We need the, the to be re-energized for, for our people. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely we all took a step back, right? Reevaluated, took a look at, I mean, and I didn't stop working throughout all of last year. I mean, sometimes it was more of those of us who are more critical about ourselves, right? And how much work we put in on a regular day to day. Once the pandemic hit, it was literally 24 yeah. seven, you know, um, ensuring that our workers had masks, ensuring that we had the accurate information, watching, you know, feverishly every single day, the reports of how many people passed and, and how many people, you know, and, and what, you know, locations were being shut down and built and National Guard coming and this happening in these hospitals and not enough machines. I mean, just to, to, to get a glimpse, I mean, I was on more Zooms, sometimes even with friends and family, just we're getting reacquainted with them, right? Just touching base to make sure the anxiety of our friends and family, did you get it? Who passed, who didn't? Those were all really serious and stressful moments. And I think, you know, you make a good point that now it's, we, we have to, we have to get back. Um, we have to get back into our communities, into the, into the business of making sure that our families and our communities uh, know the services that are available, uh, begin to uh, participate again in, in the day-to-day. -day. Many of our workers who did participate, who did it, who also didn't stop as essential workers, right? Um, and the new economies that were developed as a result of the need that our communities had uh, throughout the entire uh, pandemic and that now exist. And these are are jobs that, um, you know, we need to take a hard look at, you know, who are the people doing the, that kind of work, right, um, in our immigrant communities and how they survived, right? And as we get back into the mix of things, now we have streets that are closed, right, like sidewalks that are closed, because the business has got to taste a little bit of being able to now expand outward, and folks are like, well, we love it. Even in the winter, some of these businesses love that, right? Um, so there's a lot of things that are, that we're going to be the new normal, they call it, right? The adjustment. Um, but at the same time, there's things that are lingering from before, right? The reality that oh, some of our hardest hit communities are typically the hardest hit communities where overpopulated schools, transit deserts, right? Our communities not getting access, not having health insurance or believe that they have access to adequate health care. And so do not use um, our healthcare system, perhaps the way they should in terms of preventive care, you know. So I'm curious as to, you know, there's so many levels of being an immigrant in the city of New York. Yes. Right? Um, immigrants that have been here for decades. Yes. Immigrants who cannot, in, in many ways, apply for some of these services mm -hmm. um, that are available, let's say for Section 8, for example, or other kinds of subsidies. Um, you know, how do you manage all that, right? Because not everyone's at the level of applying for citizenship. We still so, have... Mm -hmm. The Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, I think, you know, because of the policies that were formed under 45, right, um, developed several programs that was really um, in reaction to that, right? So like, for example, when the Muslim ban happened, one of the first responders on the scene in the airports was the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, and then, you know, that those folks then started working with um, attorneys, nonprofits and others in trying to, you know, figure that out and help the families on the ground with the whole issue with the Muslim ban, right? There were things then developed, for example, a rapid response legal team, um, which we have in the office, where if there is an ICE raid or ICE shows up to pick someone up, um, someone could actually call our office, let us know what's happening, and then a person will be dispatched to the location to basically take testimony as to what occurred 
during um, that enforcement raid, right? Um, there are things, right, for example, you know, the legal services, um, the citizenship, there's this whole program, Action New York, which works with several CBOs throughout the city to assist um, constituents when they need a referral, we can give them a referral and help them first ascertain what their, what their potential issue is and then refer them out. So, um, and then there's other, there's the know your rights, right? We have a team that goes out into the community to educate the community on what their rights are when it comes to issues like detention, deportation, and other issues. So there's been a lot of things that have been developed um, for the most vulnerable immigrants. Now, I do think that um, we need to be looking at how do we also engage immigrants like, for example, you and me, right? People who um, who are either first or second generation immigrants who have studied in New York City, who are professionals, who have also been impacted deeply by the pandemic, right? And how can we, you know, collaborate with like professional organizations and others in order to help bring more services to our immigrant community, but also support those small businesses, right? I think that, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of different things that, that can be happening. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, what happened last year with George Floyd and, um, and then the issue of hate crimes against the AAPI community. And what are we doing to help educate, you know, around those issues? The, the issues are enormous, right? And then there's a lot of different players to be having conversations with. You have the city council, you have our state and state um, elected officials, you have the national. We also work with consulates, right? And we work with the consulates to help provide services like the Dominican consulate, the Venezuelan consulate, the Ecuadorian consulate, the Colombian consulate. So, you know, there's just so much, right? And I think um, it really is a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to help shape, right, um, how this recovery is looking like and assuring that immigrant communities are very much a part of this recovery effort for New York City. Now, I'm really happy that you, uh, you know, talked about small businesses, right? Talked about folks that are born and raised in this country, but come from a history of, um, you know, parents and, and pretty much raised in immigrant communities and, and can be a part of the recovery of the city in a way that is transformative for those immigrants, right? Especially newer immigrants um, that are understanding the city, but I understand and, and have have really dealt with a huge blow, I would say, um, in the last year and a half, taking on many new jobs and new tasks that they never thought um, they would be doing in the city. I'm curious about what your thoughts are about the upcoming potential mayoral uh, candidates that are um, the front runners right now. I mean, I feel like it's, I can confidently say it's either going to be Adams, Garcia, or Wiley. You know, I, I wouldn't discard Wiley just yet. Um, I heard a lot, and we heard a lot during the debates. I sometimes felt a little cringy every time folks said, oh, the most vulnerable immigrant communities. And I don't know, part of me like was happy that they said it, you know, that they were able to highlight it or talk about it. But I never understood if any of them really knew the depth, the diversity, the the details. We're not just one monolith immigrant community. It's not just Latinos. It's diverse, you know, communities throughout the city. It's not just Spanish for Latinos. It's diverse dialects from different countries of origin, different, you know, native communities that have um, come into New York City. And so we see um, the delivery of services in many different ways. And so just curious as to what you see, what, what perhaps something that may have stood out, um, you know, from all of those candidates and the things that they said that, that, you, that you're kind of looking forward to. Well, you know, I think that, I mean, honestly, I don't know, right? I don't know, you know, the, where, everything is still up in the air. They're still count, counting absentees, affidavits, all of those things. You know, and then there are the lawsuits, right? And I'm sure they're going to take it all the way to the top, right? I don't and, think and I think, you know, 
a couple of things, right? Like, let's just stick to this for a minute because it's really funny that, you know, you saw and I heard and I had, you know, a radio station on all the time, especially Spanish language radio station, trying to stop and hear the commercials in Spanish um, by many of the mayoral candidates. I, you know, the first one that I heard was Yang. You know, uh, then obviously I heard Adams and a couple of the unions who participated and, and posted their ads. I thought it was really interesting. Um, but, you know, Idanis Rodriguez, the council member, came out immediately for um, Eric Adams. You had Francisco Moya come out for Eric Adams, right? Two enclaves of, of immigrantness, right? Dominicanness, and then just uh, a diversity of immigrantness out in Queens, right? In the areas of Corona, Elmhurst, Jackson Heights. I was really fascinated that Catherine Garcia, who is not Latina, right? She has the Garcia um, from marriage, I believe, right? The last name. Catherine Garcia, who is not Latina, comes in during ranked choice voting, like in a second place. I'm curious as to how much of that is you know, folks racially polarized voting using surname of Garcia as the only, along with Morales, right? Did it not fare the same well, um, you know, Morales as Garcia, but you know, what happened there? Can we say anything about the last name as helping Garcia at all? You know, um, at the end of the day, I think, right, this, it comes down to who raised good money Mm -hmm. And who was able to really put themselves out there early, right? And so we saw, you know, with Diana Morales, you know, that was a challenge for her. She didn't raise a lot of money. She had a super grassroots campaign. And then she also had a lot of internal strife in her campaign. That's right. And so, you know. Towards I, the end, that is. Towards, too. I think that that really hurt her. Right. Um, and then, you know, Catherine Garcia, of course, you know, she's been in government for years, for decades. Um, her name is recognizable to folks because she's been in the news a lot. She did a lot of work around Hurricane Sandy and other very like critical no storms. Right. And so, um, you know, I'm on the one hand, I'm not super surprised. Right. Um, that this is happening. I think that the challenge will be for whoever um, wins at the end, you know, is to have right a successful transition, um, a very well-planned and thought out transition, because we are in a very critical moment in New York City, you know, with, um, right, where we're having our vaccination campaigns, people are getting ready to open up New York City, like fully again, right? It's not like it has ever really, it, it closed, but people were still working. Some people, you know, people have still been out there, but now, you know, now the shift is going to be okay. And now what are we going to do around issues of poverty, of, you know, uh, rent, tenants, schools, you know, I mean, it, it, it really is going to be an interesting moment in history to watch this this whole transition and really making it as successful as possible because you know I am interested in really helping it be the best that it can be you know a, because the New Yorkers deserve it New Yorkers deserve it this is what public service is right um regardless of you know campaigns and promises and all the other things right at the end of the day, this is then it then becomes about governance, you know, and governance and current and campaigns are two very different things mm -hmm. at the end of the day. You know, I'm curious as to your thoughts about, you know, immigrant children. Uh, you talked a lot about, you know, housing. Right. And the mentioning of, of rents and being able to all of that comes down to being able to have good paying jobs that they could have and, and good rent, you know, good housing, right? Affordable housing that's out there. Curious about what your thoughts are about immigrant children and whether or not there's any thoughts about when schools kick in in September, if there's going to be any supplemental, um, you know, assistance in terms of perhaps supplemental tutoring, uh, perhaps additional, you know, um, even if it's just like parent, you know, parent related support, 
uh, because these kids lost an entire year. I mean, even though they were remote, some of our children really did lose classroom time and not just classroom time, just really strict academic time. I mean, assuming they that existed before, right? Like yes, that is very true. It's true for my for my own daughter, right? Where, you know, we we basically lost, right, this this last year for a myriad of reasons. Um, but I think that you know, right now, you know, I'm I'm hoping to get to meet with the DOE and the chancellor and to talk about the issues that are impacting immigrant parents and immigrant children. Um, it is on the agenda to to have a conversation about, you know, um, I know in my own experience and my personal experience, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was a it was frustrating um that you know, th there was a lot of information that was not available in other languages. They were being put out in English. Um, and it wasn't like, it took time to, to catch up. Um, you know, New York City does have um, the language law 30, um, which mandates um, access in various languages in various city agencies. And there has been efforts um, throughout the years to encourage all the various agencies to have information accessible in various languages. But I think even, um, you know, at the next level, right, it's not just having the information available in a language. It's about how are we engaging with our parents? How are we engaging with our children? And so, you know, I'm, I'm up for continuing with having um, those conversations and working with parents and working with our community leaders to assure that, you know, the issues of immigrants are being addressed right throughout this whole recovery effort in our schools too. Yeah. So we have schools and housing, um, economic, you know, opportunities, especially for, and we, we hear it a lot about the, the liberistas or, you know, those drivers and, you know, the opportunity that was created with many of our gig workers, right, that um, did not qualify for so many of the assistance that was provided all last year. Um, our Uber drivers, Lyft, you know, are they employees, are not they employees? So many conversations around our immigrant communities, you know, that you, that I know, right, at so many different levels we're going to deal with. One that I'm really excited, um, you know, that is about, that we're going to see is the numbers, right, census. Uh, we're about to, and we're waiting uh, for the official census data uh, to be released. We'll see how much of our communities have changed or whether or not we're going to be able to see uh, the reflection of our neighborhoods and the individuals that were counted and the density in so many of our immigrant neighborhoods uh, throughout the city that were impacted uh, by the pandemic. We'll see a little bit uh, more clearly uh, what that data reflects, but what is your thought about, you know, the changing demographics? Um, what are your thoughts about uh, perhaps the, the power or the, um, you know, harnessing that collective action so that immigrant communities, especially those with the least amount of political voice, are actually heard in the policies um, that this next administration, um, you know, will begin to implement? Well, you know, I think that, right, number one is assuring that the lines of communication are open, right? So, like, for me, right, having to transition from the former commissioner um, to now, right, I have to have my series of conversations with various leaders throughout the city. Um, you know, I've had conversations so far with, like, the New York Immigration Coalition, which is a very important coalition of immigrant organizations throughout New York City. Um, who for years has been doing work around issues of policies that have been impacting immigrants and has now also shifted their work not only to doing advocacy, but assisting um, our local organizations to provide services they have never provided before. For example, assisting people with getting them food, right, and getting food access. Um, assisting people with getting, you know, things like face mask and PPE and things like that, right? So there are things that are happening for our organizations that more 
had never happened for them before and helping them, right, sustain that work while they still have to do, right, their business as usual now that it has been exacerbated by the pandemic, right? And so, you know, that that always has to be kind of like at the center of how do we continue supporting our local organizations that are really are the backbone, right? They are the backbone of helping to provide the, the most critical services for our immigrant communities. If there's any door they walk in first, it's at a social service organization in their neighborhood, right? So, you know, maintaining those lines of communication open. But I also have to say that what's been interesting for me is, you know, the fact that I am a second generation Dominican, you know, in this position and just watching how the the people are excited, right? To be able to see a, a Latina in this position, a Latina that identifies with her blackness, that wears her hair curly, you know, that, you know, all of those things, I think, also have meaning in terms of, you know, you know, looking at how we're being represented in government and also opening up those avenues of conversation. Right. And so, you know, the fact that I'm, I come in also with this perspective that I've had even on this show, I've had a lot of conversations around anti-Blackness in the Dominican community and being able to carry out those kind of conversations, you know, at the city level also, right, matters, right, as, as we're looking at issues of not only immigration status, but also how race plays into that. Um, and having those conversations, uh, you know, in, in how policies are formed, you know, in, in, in who gets hired, in who, you know, and in all of those things, right? So um, I think that, and, and the fact that, like, you know, I'm a native New Yorker, right? I was born and raised in New York. I went to schools in New York my whole life. Um, you know, having grown up here, having had my youth here, you know, I think I, you know, the, the perspective I bring is very, you know, different, right, from I think maybe other other past commissioners that have been in in the position, right? And so I think that it's it's an interesting point of being able to bring in um, the Latino immigrant voice, right, while at the same time, you know, collaborating and working with all of our immigrant communities. You know, I think that that is interesting, like with this whole hate crime issue, you know, it's important that Latinos out against these kind of crimes, right. Right? right? And that we are also in allyship with our Asian brothers and sisters on these issues, right? I mean, we have also been victims of hate crimes as well, right? But I think at this particular moment to be able to show that um, that's that's big, right? And and it shows um, strength, and it shows um, where our values are and where they lie. So yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess I can go on and on, but I think I mean, I, I I think it's really interesting that you bring in the race conversation because a lot of times what we don't have in our immigrant communities is the real race conversation, right? You know, some of the things that we say both in Spanish, in English, in whatever, you know, we don't realize how racialized and how our tones change when we're having conversations about specific issues. Or, you know, I recall seeing something on my, I was tagged on something on my social media and I was so disappointed. I was like so disappointed to hear the conversations about what's happening with the deliberitas, right? And how they're being, you know, um, you know, young people are like, you know, um, taking their bicycles or they're, you know, mugging them, you know, in transit when they're and the risks that they're put into because of, you know, what's happening and the crime that's going up in our streets. And yet the, the, the terms that I heard were so embedded in like racism and were embedded in like poverty issues and classism that I was I was kind of distraught because I was like hold up 
I know these issues exist, right? We know that we have young people not doing what's right. We have a lot, but that doesn't mean they come from the projects because I heard a lot of that, right? Because many of our immigrant communities, especially those that do not are not eligible to live in, in public housing will disparage those that live in public housing as if, you know, there is this understanding that they're all thugs, that they're all criminals, that they're all, the, and it was, really disheartening because I was shocked. I was just like, oh my God, we, we say those things like in and and out in social media and they were tagging elected officials. I was like, no, this is not, I get what's at stake here. I get what's what's happening in a community and how certain communities are targeting if we've seen this in the past, right? The one that knows against the one that knows less, right? Or presuming that that person is not going to go to the police to, you know, kind of uh, do a report on the attacks, or that the police is also not paying attention, doesn't care. Oh, that always happens. They're carrying cash. They make presumptions about our immigrant communities. And then I get a lot of responses from those in government that are like, well, you know, those people don't vote. And as a result, you know, none on either side, the kind of conversation that flows is like, you know, those that are, that vote get the kind of response that you're looking for, Lucia. And that's a little bit, you know, uh, disheartening. But I think one of the things that we need to highlight is the fact that you come from a perspective that someone that's born here, we can see both sides, right? I think both of us can say that we worked on behalf of immigrant communities with immigrant communities to empower immigrant communities, yeah. you know, both new generation and second generation. That's a very different perspective, right? Like we can see why, but there's so much racism embedded in the conversation that it really stifles collaboration among so much diversity that exists in the city. So I'm really happy um, that you raised that, you know, as something that uh, you're going to be looking at, right? And and trying to figure out how to best. It's tough, right? Because, right, traditionally, um, a lot of us, right, fall into these good versus bad dichotomies, right? Instead of really looking at, okay, this is what, I mean, essentially poverty, right, creates this situation. And, you know, and, and another difficult situation is our communities want safe communities, right? Our communities want to be able to live in healthy communities. Um, and, and they want to have some form of policing, right? At the same time, you know, having to balance being over-policed and being, you know, and dealing with these other issues, right? So it's like, there's a lot of tensions to deal with and how are we engaging with the community to have these conversations and to, work through these and basically like as the mayor has said disentangle right disentangle these issues so that we really get to the core of what's happening and not saying oh these people are bad and these people are are the good folks so it is it is a challenge right and i think you know now being in this pandemic you know a lot of people have lost jobs a lot of people have lost, you know, they lost school time, you know, opportunities to be in an after school program or whatever it is. And so you they know, lost family, they lost their major support. We, we you know, our, our, our New Yorkers are traumatized. I mean, you know, we cannot say that we have not been through a trauma, right, to have, you know, of our neighbors die in such a short period of time, you know? And so like keeping those mental health issues also in mind, right? It's not only about how do we get police, but how do we get mental health services to our community? And especially to a community that traditionally does not like the term therapist, right? They'll tell you, you know, say local, I'm not crazy. Why do you think I'm crazy? And, and by the way, we don't have enough therapists. Oh, and people of color, people who speak both languages, and we have a lot of people, including myself, that enjoy the opportunity to download, understand, be able to like come to grips with the trauma, come to grips with life circumstances, everyday situations, our children. So I don't know, part of me wants to also tell folks, 
if you see something, you know, speak to someone, right? Like, you know, if you, and, and sometimes, you know, without judgment, right? I mean, I think that's, that's hard for our communities where for a long time, those issues literally like in the novels have been locked up in the attic, right? And no one wants to talk about the, about the, that cousin, you know, or that parent or that relative. And it's us, right? It's our kids, you but know, it's. Of not knowing. I think, you know, and, and I just realized this even for myself this past week that, you know, you find something going on with someone, but you're not sure. And it's, and you, and then you realize, oh, they may, they have a mental health issue. It, you know, and it's like, I never thought of, I always said it was their personality or their, you know, whatever. Right. And it, no, it really is this. And now it makes me think of that person differently, I guess, in a more compassionate and empathetic way. And, um, but I think like for myself, right, you know, I've been to therapy, I've, you know, I've done all of that. So, you know, it's, um, I guess I'm a little bit more aware of it, right? So it's like, how do we create more of that awareness within our communities where it is more acceptable, where people really understand that it's an important part of our overall health, right? It's not oh. about eating healthy and exercising and looking cute. You know, what are we doing to take care of our minds and our hearts? And sometimes we don't even um, think about it in those same terms, right? I remember a really low period in my own life, right, where, you know, thanks to professional leadership development and different programs that existed for professionals, it was kind of masked not as therapy or as self-help or self-care and, and those components, but it was, it's therapy. It's therapeutic. It's the ways in which we have to deal with some of the trauma that, that come forward. And, and the reality is, you know, I would say like, you know, to a lot of folks, it's going to take the entire community. It's not going to be, this has taken an entire city to get out of this. This was not one man or one woman, and I would repeat it, not one man sitting anywhere in the state, you know, that has allowed New York City to rise above all of the issues that have taken place throughout, you know, this last couple of months. And so reality is that we're going to need everyone uh, to engage and participate. I know that um, there you know, Raquel, you, you took the mantle and you and you pretty much uh, led, you know, this uh, program. Curious as to what you want to see, you know, kind of talked about. I know you had a lot of diversity in the conversations uh, that you had. I want to actually allow folks to be able to email us, right, or make sure you post on this video a topic, a conversation that you want to see, a recommendation. I'm always open uh, to that stuff. But what's your kind of vision? You know, I want to make sure that that so, so, you know, so Critica, you know, we have our website, Critica.nyc. We have our email, Critica.nyc at gmail.com, where people can always send comments. We have an Instagram account and a Facebook group where people can also send um, comments or what you would like to see on the show. I mean, look, I think that there's a plethora of things to talk about, right? In the past, I would say the the 80, 85%, maybe 90% of the people that have come to the show have been Dominican or of Dominican descent. Um, you know, we had uh, Linda Sarsour talk about the Derek Chauvin case. Um, you know, we had Julissa Gutierrez and Wendy Garcia talk about diversity and MWBEs at the city and the state level. You know, and I think right now it's ripe, right, to be able to have conversations about um, the next six months, the transition, our newly elected officials and their vision of what they're going to be doing. Um, you know, hearing from the from the various groups that do really important work throughout New York on, you know, what their vision is moving forward. I would love to hear from people from other states like Texas, right, who they're gaining seats that we in New York lost. And so what is that going to mean for all of us, right, as we move forward in the national debate and the development of what's going to be happening over the next two years? Um, you know, and, and then there's like the international 
uh, issues that are happening, right? We had uh, people from the Dominican Republic talking about La Tres Casuales, the three exceptions, and um, you know the pro-choice movement in the Dominican Republic. Uh, there's been a lot of issues happening in Puerto Rico around issues of domestic violence. Um, you know, I think that there is really just so much for us to talk about. And there are so many great Latino leaders out there that are doing work, um, you know, in all of these areas, right? Experts that I think could be coming on and sharing with, with us on what's happening in their areas. So, um, you know, I definitely want to continue hearing from our, our young people, our millennials. Well, I think, look, I think, you know, from... Obviously, my my always um, narrative is about talking about politics and the policies and the numbers and the data. And one of the things that I loved about Angelo was that he never, you know, Angelo Falcón was never far from saying, well, what is, you know, we can have intellectual stimulation, stimulating conversations. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what does it mean for people? What does it mean that they wake up in the, every morning and go to work and do they have shelter? Do they have, you know, an opportunity with education to be able to move forward? Do they have good paying jobs? Do they have, you know, affordable housing? How do they raise their families? How much time can you give? I remember he was always on my case about how much time I gave to my daughter because that will make or break what path my child would take and what all these things that, you know, at the end of the day, it's like some of the way in which our government functions or our nonprofits function, right? It's like, or we hope they function, which is, you know, we invest so much money and what is the outcome, yeah. right? We can invest so much time and so much conversation and so much critical thought, but at the end of the day, has it made lives better? Yeah. And, you know, as we move forward in these programs, in these programs, I want to have that conversation. What is all this intellectual, how does it impact people? Yeah. And can we, with some solid information, help make lives better yeah. for our communities? Time for us to wrap up. But this has been really great. And I'm really looking forward to you, Lucia, to being the host. I'll be watching. I'll be <laughs> you out behind the scenes. I am so excited that Critica NYC gets to continue the conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Seneda Mendez. Thank you, Freddy Pinto. Thank you, Manhattan Neighborhood Network for all of your work and for keeping the lines of communication open. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for trusting me. Bye.